Yay, welcome back. So today and Thursday, I look forward to, and I'm sure everyone else as well, to hearing about the progress you've made on your research project since the beginning of the semester. Um, and we have a schedule that I announced in an email somewhere, uh, which I don't have in front of me right now. Uh, we can go in any order. I don't, it doesn't really matter. And I saw Jeremy and Austin, you guys switched. Yes. Fine. Thank you, Austin. Uh, I, Jeremy, I could have scheduled you directly on Thursday if I knew. No, no, it's all right. I didn't know either. Um, okay, so who wants to go first or what is the order we had in that email? Uh, I was supposed to go first and I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, well, take it away. Okay, cool. Um, great. Oh, so Feel mm -hmm. free to type comments in the chat box about the research or things like this to help with people's presentations or research in general. If you have thoughts, um, feel free to just type them in chat. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. So can everybody see this? Okay, cool. So hi, everyone. I'll be discussing my uh, project, which was the trans experience in open source software. Um, yeah, I discussed the motivation a little bit in our uh, previous presentations, but I'll just sort of refresh uh, our memory. So um, the importance of this space is that uh, open source is a growing domain where lots of people can view uh, code and also contribute code, but it has a sort of stereotype of being unwelcoming, uh, an unwelcoming space for marginalized groups, particularly women and people of color. Um, trans and non-binary people have been uh, an important part of open source for a while. Sage Sharp, who is a non-binary developer um, and one of the original um, developers of Linux left because of the toxicity within that community. And Coraline at MK, um, who is a trans woman, also wrote the Contributors Covenant, which is the most widely used code of conduct. And uh, as open source and uh, that space continues to grow, there are growing concerns that you know new members and new, newcomers and new developers and members of LGBTQ, sorry, LGBTQIA plus may feel unwelcome contributing to open source, and that's something we want to work towards um, fixing. Um, yeah. So many um, issues that we know, sort of gender-related issues that we know in open source, are specific to women, um, and so we know that they are more likely they're likely to dry, drop out of projects earlier and have higher rates than men. Um, lots of toxicity, toxicity in the spaces that they uh, encounter, um, but no study has been done on the unique challenges faced by trans folk and open source specifically. Um, and so a lot of these questions that I want answered is how, how do we figure out a little bit more about what do trans people um, actually experience? What do they go through and how can we alleviate it, any issues and give them the support that they need. Um, so, you know, things that I'm one, I wonder about as a researcher is how do trans people get involved in open source initially? How do they learn about it? Um, how do their careers progress? Do, where do they find their support from? How, you know, are, do they drop out at uh, similarly high rates? Um, what are their interactions like? Are they positive? Do they encounter some of the toxicity that we've seen? Um, and how do they represent themselves on GitHub and other online uh, spaces? So um, lots of people aren't open about their identities. Um, and so how hidden are they is a question. And um, again, we might be missing some of the contributions that we make as we've seen with women. Uh, women do a lot of community oriented work. Um, so documentation and working on the code of conduct and other contributions that we don't really see on GitHub. And so is it a similar case for uh, trans and non-binary individuals. Um, and so these uh, questions that I have turned into research questions, which were, um, how do trans and non-binary individuals' careers progress in open source? Um, and especially how do they uh, represent themselves around their uh, transition and how do they make their identity known? And does that impact their interactions? Um, are they more prone to attacks or early dropout rates because of their identities? Um, where do they find their support systems within open source and how can we bolster that, um, you know, going forward and how do they reflect their identity or changes uh, online. And so to go a little bit into um, the related work of this and, you know, uh, in the space. 
So there's a lot of foundational work, especially on uh, gender issues specific to women for open source, but again, not so much uh, specifically for open source, which has a, sorry, not so much for trans folk, which is again, a unique space. So uh, Professor Oliver Hamson has done a lot of work in this area. Um, he did this interesting um, sort of study with uh, which was called trans technology and talking to a lot of trans participants and asking them essentially to if you could like create any sort of technology possible what would you create and from that you know the a lot of like sort of the unique things that trans people face such as you know issues with the healthcare system body dysmorphia um, you know fearing for their personal safety because of their nature lots of those issues came out um, and so those ideas going forward sort of like influenced my questions for the study. So how can we, um, you know, make this space better for trans folk? Um, and then also Oliver created um, this uh, trans specific social media site called Trans Time, which isn't out yet, but it's currently in progress. And again, that was sort of taking the um, unique characteristics of this group and trying to integrate that into a technology that they could use and feel safe in. And um, there's also been uh, a fair amount of work on LGBT TQI plus in online spaces. Um, so a common theme is disconnect amongst uh, online profiles for this group. So uh, Finstas or fake Instagrams, it just, which is a second account that you know is somewhat less serious than people's main account are largely used by LGBT um, plus youth as a way for them to be more open about their identities without connecting to people um, in their personal life that they would normally meet. And then um, LGBTQ plus users were also, also found to heavily tailor their privacy um, on social media accounts, again, because they, they were concerned for their you know, personal and physical safety. Um, and uh, another theme is the different uses and representations uh, given on different social media sites. So different sites uh, mean that people sort of tailor them and, care, you know, and uh, customize them to represent different profiles. So one paper and the title is Too Gay for Facebook, which I love, um, sort of gives you that idea of how Facebook, for example, is a site where lots of people have relatives and people that they see in everyday life. And so that might not be a space for people to come out in, or they might not feel comfortable doing that yet. Whereas uh, a space like Tumblr, for example, which is largely anonymous, is feels like a lot much more safer space and has sort of developed this um, this sort of reputation to be an open welcoming space with lots of resources um, for trans and non-binary folk. And then um, another paper by Pinter discusses that um, while lots of these, um, when trans folk are getting into different social media sites, there's a lot of concerns about what are the consequences. So concerns, am I going to get like accidentally outed by, you know, friend requests and connections and things like that to people that I don't want to be outed to. And so now I'll go a little bit into the methods and how I formulated this study. So uh, overall, I used uh, semi-structured interviews to get a little bit more detail and again, hear about the unique experiences that trans participants face in open source. So uh, first, I started off with um, convenience sampling. I had some participants from a previous study, which was unrelated to, well, not explicitly related to gender in open source. And I sort of reached out to them again and told them about this study. I also did a GitHub search. So looking at users on GitHub, searching for terms uh, like trans in their profile, they, them pronouns, that sort of thing. Um, and then I also used the snowballing approach. So asking participants to refer friends and colleagues who might be um, applicable to the study. Um, so I emailed participants and explicitly mentioned that it was a study on the experiences of trans and non-binary developers in open source. And I sort of let them know, you don't have to answer every question. It's gonna be anonymous, that sort of thing. Um, and then for my criteria for participants, I looked at their GitHub activity just to make sure that they have um, several public contributions within the past year, just so they had some recent experiences to talk about. Uh, participation was not compensated. And at this point I have uh, interviewed 12 participants so far. And so a little bit of information about demographics. I mostly had white participants, uh, two identified as Asian and one identified as African-American. Um, and for gender, they were mostly um, trans participants, but two were non-binary and one was genderqueer. And uh, one thing I wanna point out 
is that a lot of most of my participants, seven out of the 12, had some sort of indication on the profile that they were trans. Um, and so that is a little bit of a bias that I am talking to largely so far people who are obviously very comfortable with their identity and feel comfortable putting it out there, but that might not uh, represent the overall population and kind of hoping that snowballing will like alleviate that a little bit. But um, yeah, I've stopped recruiting for now, but that's something I wanna go back to later. Um, yeah, so to go a little bit into my interviews, um, they were semi-structured to get uh, to discuss the topics that I wanted to discuss, but also leave some room uh, for more, you know, for anything that came up. And they were around an hour each and conducted over Zoom. So the discuss topics were their backgrounds in open source. So how they got um, into open source initially, how they learned about it, and then how their careers progressed to where they are now. Um, their experiences as a trans and non-binary person in open source overall. So what do they have to say on a general level? Their um, online representation, so looking you know, at their GitHub and uh, social media, specifically things like uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, so more professional profiles associated with their you know, jobs as developers or uh, programmers, um, their positive and negative experiences in open source and any gender related experiences, and their recommendations for the open source communities going forward. Um, so then, while I'm still transcribing the interviews and I just finished the last one uh, last week, two weeks ago. So um, yeah, so still doing working on the transcriptions, but the plan is um, to follow grounded theory. Um, and then that essentially entails open coding of the uh, first couple of interviews, uh, comparing them to see if any you know, initial patterns emerge, axial coding to develop the themes um, that you know, are gonna make up the foundation of the code book. And then I want to conduct more interviews and I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, just to get to theoretical saturation, so something, nothing new comes up from the um, interviews, which is gonna be a little tricky considering this is a small group, but that's, that's the plan for now. And then after that, selective coding with the additional interviews and the additional data, and then doing more applications of the coding scheme. And then finally, um, developing a theory based on the um, codes that I come up with. So yeah, as I mentioned, I want to recruit more people, um, reach theoretical saturation where you know nothing new comes up from the interviews. Um, and I'd also like to aim for a more diverse participant pool. Um, one reason for this is that in the sort of trans literature that I've read, uh, many of them point out that the experiences of white trans and non-binary folk can be very different from those of uh, people of color. So it's important to incorporate those. Um, and then if necessary, uh, rework my research questions to better reflect the data that I'm coming up with. And so I can go into a little bit more detail of some sort of preliminary results that I've seen and some things that have come up so far. So um, identity effect on interest. So this um, quote is an example where a person who um, changed their activity on GitHub, and that was because before they transitioned, they're on GitHub more regularly working on their own projects and after they transitioned, they were no longer interested in those things. Um, and that was sort of related to, you know, their transition and having different hobbies now and different uh, things they were working on. And so they moved to working on uh, contributions to smaller projects and newer projects instead, which was really interesting. And then lots of, part uh, two participants so far have mentioned an almost like causal relationship between being trans and working in open source. What they kind of discussed was that um, being trans means you're probably marginalized from like the offline world around you. And so you seek sol uh, solace from the online world and that gets you into computers and that gets you into open source. So that's something that interesting that came up and you know something I wanna check out a little bit more. Um, there's also an issue of identity separation and uh, defensive strategies. So uh, this participant discussed a disconnect between their offline uh, life and their online life. They're, online profile, like their conversations and interactions there were much more true to how they felt with regards to their gender and they represented themselves how they felt was most true to themselves. Whereas offline, they, lots of people didn't feel entirely safe or comfortable doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of people also mentioned that 
they had this sort of defense mechanism, preemptive defense mechanism, given you know, the nature of the world and open source that they were constantly expecting bad experiences. And as a result, they were trying to make their online strategy in pu more public uh, spaces as like little and as hidden as possible. Um, lots of participants also mentioned hiddo, hidden micro microaggressions. Um, and so what that essentially was is lots of the people I talked to had hunches that they had been discriminated against because of their identities, but they didn't have anything concrete. So for this example, um, there was the participant I interviewed who was trans and then another participant uh, who was cis and they essentially had identical contributions, but the cis persons got you know, much more attention and much more feedback while the trans, the trans participants uh, contribution was completely ignored. And it was one of those things where, again, you can't really tell if that's by accident or, um, or not, but multiple, participants mentioned that, so that was interesting. And uh, it was also discussed that on GitHub specifically, it's hard to tell because it's not a social media site where people share their opinions as much as Twitter or Facebook. And so it's hard to gauge what, you know, what is actually influencing, what are the sort of opinions behind these decisions being made. And they can't uh, sort of refute, refute anything openly transphobic because that doesn't really show up on, uh, on GitHub. And um, finally, the uh, imagined audience on GitHub and other social media. So uh, many participants uh, described how they sort of changed their profiles to reflect their identities. Um, so participant one created a whole like GitHub organization so that they could redirect their dead name profile, not lose those contributions, but remove that profile. And that was able to sort of link all their past contributions to their new profile with their new name. Um, what was interesting is that many of the participants came out to their online friends first, um, people that they had met through Discord and other private servers, and then they would come out to sort of um, close family and friends in, in the offline world. Um, Facebook was one of the last social media sites to be updated with any changes, and that's uh, because of the sort of um, relationship to more extended family that you'd want to deal with and people that you meet in person that you might not feel comfortable um, opening, you know, coming out to. And um, the degree of change for Twitter and LinkedIn also varied because sometimes people use that as um, uh, sort of professional networking sites and sometimes they didn't. And some participants either completely removed their old Twitter or LinkedIn, created a new account, or others just updated like the name and the pronouns and others uh, also just kept their profile because of the connections that they didn't wanna lose them. So yeah, it, it varied amongst the participants. Uh, but one thing that was interesting is that there was the general sense of, you know, these certain spaces to stay away from were 4chan and uh, Reddit given their sort of alt-right conservative um, nature which is traditionally unkind to uh, trans people. And yeah, that's what I've come up with so far. And the goal with this, uh, like I said, is to do more interviews, do more analysis, and hopefully get it to a point where some sort of recommendations can be, be, can be made on how to make GitHub and other open source communities uh, safer for uh, trans and non-binary contributors. Yeah, questions? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing. This was great, thanks, thanks a lot. I guess let's do quick questions live here. Uh, I've been putting all kinds of comments in chat, so feel free to look at that as well. Um, and just to kind of not, uh, to be mindful of time, let's, let's keep questions to sort of short things here and so we could follow up separately. Oh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, great presentation. Um, in terms of, I guess, future research um, report, like um, goals. So once you find out some insights about um, like these online uh, GitHub and such, like mm -hmm. how do you plan to like take that into account? Um, or do you have any, I guess, goals in terms of how to um, like follow up on your work? Sorry, can you repeat that? I, I kind of, I think I misunderstood. Sure, I just wanted, the question was more of like, future research goals after you do um, after you do all your insights and such. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, I haven't really thought about it so far. So far, the goal is um, to publish this and hopefully come up with some sort of recommendations for community managers and um, the people at GitHub on how to make these uh, spaces safer. But I guess beyond that, um, maybe a little bit more on, um, yeah, maybe expanding to different groups. There's not a lot on uh, sort of uh, people of color as well. And I know there's some research going on with that, but there, yeah, but there are other like marginalized groups who also have their own unique set of um, in, like what they would like and what is uh, applicable to their needs. So yeah, just moving on to, I guess, a different group. The way I interpreted the question was more about some implications for design. Like, would you change anything and how the platform operates or is designed or things like this to make it, I don't know, for example, easier for people to um, change their names and identities and maintain all their contributions, things like that. You know, maybe there's some implications around there. So could, could you come up with some interventions to make it better uh, in some way based on what you're learning from this? Right, yeah. Um, one participant actually mentioned that GitHub was actually better than most uh, of these sites. And as far as like up, update, like updating their identity, um, certain social media sites, like I think Facebook won't let you register with a new email and some people have their dead name in their email account. And so that's uh, really tedious. And some people ask for ID and things like that. So um, yeah, just lo lowering those barriers for um, updating their identities, updating their name and uh, pronouns. Uh, and again, GitHub is okay-ish compared to others, but that's a low bar. Um, and so, yeah, making it easier, making it easier and also potentially creating some sort of um, programs or connections for mentorship within the trans community. So more seasoned uh, trans developers helping uh, younger trans developers uh, out and there's a big sense of community that's come up within these interviews on um, trans developers always liking to see each other or even trans allies uh, you know working with each other and um, helping with each other's work and so yeah some sort of mentorship program for um, newer developers I think would also be super helpful. Cool, thanks, thanks a lot. A virtual round of applause. So, sounds great, looks great. I think you're on the right track. Who's next? Um, CJ and I uh, are on the list. Uh, we can go next, that's okay. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Looks good. Yeah, looks good. All right, cool. Um, all right, then I'll get started. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, today, uh, CJ and I are going to talk about uh, our progress in the Rust Security Project. Um, so, so first of all, um, just to recap, so ROS is uh, an open source meta operating system for robots. Uh, it provides um, the most services you would expect from an operating system, including uh, hardware abstraction, low level device control, uh, implementation of commonly used functionality, message passing, package man management. So over the years, ROS has provided a reliable framework and the common standard for robotics applications. That's uh, so because this ROS is heavily utilized by the research community for uh, service robots uh, applications. Recently, due to its outstanding capability and simplicity, it has drawn tremendous attention from the industry and the government who are trying to uh, apply uh, ROS to a wide range of uh, safe, uh, security critical systems. Um, however, um, the mission of the ROS project is solely to increase the reusability. It didn't have security in mind. And it's definitely not designed for uh, security critical applications. So over the years, um, security researchers have revealed numerous network-based vulnerabilities such as communication interception, 
or eavesdropping due to the lack of encryption mechanism. Um, in some cases, the ROS developers simply disable the encryption mechanisms because of um, developer wants to optimize for the energy consumption. Um, so ROS community has realized this deficiencies in 2015 and started development of the next generation ROS system, um, ROS2 and SROS that compensate for security. Um, however, these projects are currently under uh, uh, heavy development. Most of the ROS based systems are still written in the original non-secure version of the ROS system. Uh, so furthermore, in the near future, robots uh, may very well be part of our lives from the non-invasive home appliances like Roomba to invasive technologies that can practically make us cyborgs uh, like Neuralink. Um, security issues will present unique challenges in privacy and safety, and it has enormous implications in our relationships with technology and the quality of our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so we want to help with this. Um, our goal of the project is to provide guidelines to ROS, uh, ROS application developers on how to secure their systems from an architectural level. Um, and furthermore, we want to gather information from the application developers and provide them to the platform developers um, and to guide them to build future uh, ROS security infrastructures. Right, so, <clears throat> so basically there are three sets of uh, related work here. Uh, so, so the first set is ROS vulnerabilities. So researchers have have presented uh, what vulnerabilities ROS systems has, and also demonstrate that how an attacker can can use this uh, can 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 use these vulnerabilities to attack a system. Uh, so the sec uh, uh, the second set of research are um, many researchers have proposed uh, different security frameworks. So as mentioned, SROS is a framework that is proposed to uh, sec uh, secure ROS systems. Uh, often they provide support for uh, like encrypting the communication channels or restricting uh, which nodes can, com can, can communicate with, with each other by some access control uh, mechanisms. Uh, however, not many guidelines ha have been presented um, how developers should utilize uh, this kind of frameworks or tools to secure their, their systems. So researchers have shown that these kind of security mechanisms like encryption can introduce performance overhead. But in robot robotics, performance is, some, um, is often kind of on the, the most important quality attribute. So um, one group of researchers ha uh, have worked on general guidelines for architecting raw systems, but not security focus. So, so that's our work is, is designed to, help to fill up this gap, uh, this gap. So we intend to provide guidelines for developers on how to uh, how to utilize kind of uh, security mechanisms to secure their systems. So next page. Uh, so we have three research questions uh, based on our goals. Uh, so first is uh, we would like to explore the architectural characteristics of different ROS-based projects um, by domains. Um, we may ask uh, we, we we want to answer that what are the typical architecture patterns used for a domain and also what are the frequent used libraries and what are their functionalities. And second, we'd like to uh, generate guidelines uh, for ROS developers um, um, for how to secure their, their ROS systems. And third, um, by collecting feedback from ROS practitioners, we'd like to provide uh, implications for platform developers or uh, so by platform developers, we mean like ROS, like the the, the, the developers by, that develop ROS and also developers that develop uh, uh, security frameworks like SROS. So we like to guide them, like we like to provide them implications on how, what kind of features the uh, developers want uh, for, for, to secure their systems. Yeah, next page. Yeah. So um, to address this uh, research questions, our research mainly focuses on two parts. Um, first is the, the qualitative semi-structure semi uh, interviews with the raw system developers. Um, and uh, second is the, the quantitative survey for a broader ROS uh, developer community. So wh why do we use mixed methods? Uh, so first, uh, why do we use interviews? Uh, we're not ROS experts. Um, so we do not have extensive experience in developing the ROS based systems. 
So interview helps us to understand the process of how developer tailored their robotics applications to the ROS platform. Uh, it also gives us a fuller picture of the architecture of the specific ROS projects, since most existing documentation are either incomplete or um, the documentation is simply non-existent. So um, another phenomenon we've noticed is that there are a lot of tacit knowledge uh, within each repository. This is especially true for the project that was, I was exploring called PX4, where the ROS bridge uh, directly interacts with multiple uh, flight, control, uh, flight control hardware for uh, hobbyists. So since we don't uh, know how exactly the hardware works, the functionality of each port, and so we have no way of mapping out the, the complete architecture. So lastly, developers uh, care about the ROS platform since they uh, inter interface most frequently with the ROS platform and have a real uh, stake in it and deserve the most to shape the future of it. So basically we think that their feedbacks are the most valuable ones. So, so the reason why um, we use quantitative uh, survey approach is to counteract or reduce the biases in selecting the projects, the developers uh, during interviews. Uh, no matter, uh, so no, no method is uh, perfect and no matter um, how many developers we recruit for the interview, uh, how represented the projects we select, it will always um, just be tip of the iceberg. We will always uh, have blind spots. Survey counteracts this threat to validity and it can potentially improve the outreach of our research and better evaluate our guidelines. So in addition, we uh, will also provide an interface uh, for them to give additional feedbacks uh, or guidelines. And we believe that they can be valuable addition to our guidelines. Um, so therefore, uh, the semi structured interview can effectively allow us to address uh, the research question one and two, namely the architectural characteristics and eliciting developer guidelines, whereas the, whereas the survey can give us uh, more options uh, for uh, developer guidelines um, and uh, address the third question, uh, third research question and improve uh, future ROS releases. Um, so we, we further broke down this process to smaller manageable steps. Uh, just to walk through it, we first select um, the ROS projects that are representative of do their domains in GitHub. Uh, we then read their documentation and extract some basic architectural information and briefly build the system uh, up and see um, its purpose, its interface, what it's like at runtime, so we can be more relatable to the developers during the interview. Uh, so then we will be recruiting the interviewees and proceed with the interview. Uh, we then use the information gathered from developers to conduct the threat modeling and elicit further guidelines uh, and conduct the survey to evaluate each guidelines and elicit more, uh, more guidelines for developers. Um, so, uh, so first, this is the process we follow for selecting our ROS projects of interest. We start with a large selection of uh, ROS based projects on GitHub, uh, including the options uh, from a previous research done by our colleague, Iveno. Um, it is then sorted by the categories based on its use cases. Just to name a few, we have uh, self driving car, uh, UAV, uh, humanoid, uh, uh, ground robots, uh, underwater vehicle, and manufactured robots. Uh, it is then sorted by three metrics uh, of the repository, including uh, the number of stars, the recent commit activity, and the completeness of the documentation. Uh, so after passing through these filters, we, uh, we were able to compile a list of ROS-based projects of interest. Yeah, so, okay. So before we start our interview, uh, we'd like to extract the basic architectural information about the selected projects. Uh, we believe this can help us build the uh, the code for analyzing the transcripts after we have the interview. Um, I'm just going to briefly uh, describe uh, the, the basic four concepts in ROS. Uh, next page. So, so Node is a, Node is a, is a basic computation uh, unit in, in ROS. So it's basically a operating system process. And next, so topic is a message bus over which nodes can exchange messages. So a node can publish to a topic and a receiver can subscribe to a topic uh, receiving messages without knowing the, the publishers. Next. And a server, uh, and, and a service implements a service-oriented architecture. 
Uh, so a client can send requests to a service provider and wait for the response. And lastly, the uh, ROS provides a parameter server, uh, which is a uh, uh, which is a kind of a shared storage that is often used to store system configurations as key value pairs. So so ROS provide uh, ROS has provided easy to use tools to extract this information from a running system. Uh, thus, we can extract information for for our selected projects, which can help us better communicate with the interviewees before we have the uh, interview. Yeah, so um, um, so um, since we're expecting a very low response rate, uh, so uh, due, due to time commitment required, we are uh, employing a very lenient recruitment rec uh, requirements for the interviewees. Uh, we require the participants uh, to must have like uh, must be currently active developers of the project in our list, uh, and uh, they they must have um, a year or more experience in developing for us. Uh, based system projects and uh so and also they have uh recently committed uh to the project uh within the past month to be exact um so so we have also devised our uh interview protocol um so these are four uh, sections uh within the protocol including the developer experience um project details uh the developers take on security and reflecting on raw security and platform in general um, so for developer experience, uh, the goal is trying to determine the uh, senior, seniority of uh, the developer. For example, we can try to rank um, the illicit guidelines based on their seniority and prioritize guidelines from those who are more senior. Um, we, we will be asking questions about um, uh, the number of years uh, of their development experience uh, for specific projects and raw space projects in general. Um, the number of raw space projects that have been ever contributed to. Um, so next for the project details, we simply want to get a, a better grasp of, of the project. And we will first ask open-ended questions like, could you please tell me more about the project? Would you mind helping us walking through the um, system architecture, et cetera? So then we'll be asking uh, more questions like, uh, what role do you play uh, for a project? What's the purpose of the project? And what's the hardware that the uh, uh, system is interfacing to obtain some tacit knowledge about the hardware. Uh, so for the security section, uh, we want to understand the currently uh, deployed security mechanisms, their effectiveness and vulnerabilities. We want to explore security related issues developers have encountered. Uh, we also want to know whether the security is one of their priorities and their the system, uh, whether the security mechanism that they put in place are effective in practice. Um, and lastly, we uh, want them to reflect on the security aspect of their projects, specifically to elicit security guidelines and provide feedbacks on the cross platform and future revisions for uh, security infrastructure. Questions can include uh, project specific ones like what are the practices you have followed to enhance the overall system security and reliability? Uh, what security related libraries are being used? Um, it can also be more generalized ones like what guidelines do you recommend all ROS developers to follow? Uh, and lastly, it can uh, also be open-ended feedback oriented questions like what feed feedbacks do you have for ROS and how do you think uh, ROS can be improved, et cetera? Yeah, so, so after the interview, we will also implement a more uh, formal process uh, that is threat modeling to generate the guidelines. So because the, the reason behind here is that not all the uh, interviewees, that is the developers of raw system are security experts. So although we ask them for guidelines, uh, we think we still need uh, another formal process that to generate guidelines. So threat modeling is a process that can, can do this. So the diagram here shows, um, shows an example for uh, of, uh, threat modeling. So basically it contains a description of a certain threat or vulnerability then the category shows how this um, vulnerability can be used to attack a system. Then it, we, then it also evaluates the, uh, how risky the, the threat is and, uh, and which assets of the system uh, can be impacted by the, by the threat. Also, it shows uh, through which system interface uh, the vulnerability can be exploited. And finally, uh, finally, it provides mitigation strategy, which become our guidelines. Uh, so next page. 
So finally, after the, the threat modeling, we will have a set of guidelines. We'll use a survey targeting all the ROS developers on GitHub to evaluate the, uh, the guidelines. So basically for each guideline, we will use a Likert scale uh, to, evaluate, to evaluate its usefulness. Um, and after that, we will also provide open-ended questions um, to ask uh, developers that, do you think there are any other, uh, uh, other mechanisms that should be applied in order to make the system more secure? And the next page. So uh, about threat to validity, uh, so first of all, the selected projects uh, may not be representative enough. Um, which, uh, which can, so, so, if, uh, so, what I, uh, so the, 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 the threat here is that uh, they may not be able to represent uh, a certain domain and which result that our guidelines may not be applicable or useful in, uh, in, in, in this domain. And also the guidelines are generated from interview, uh, the, uh, the, opinion, the knowledge of the interview, an interviewees and also by a threat modeling process by the author. So which may be subjective. Uh, however, we, we, we think that um, threat modeling is kind of a formal process and we also use the survey to evaluate our guidelines. So we think this threat is, uh, is mitigated by, by, uh, by our uh, methods. And finally, because we are, we are doing a semi-structured interview and interviews are often hard to produce. So we may have this reprodu uh, reproducibility problem for, uh, for our results. Uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's all for this part. Huh? Next page. Um. Yeah, so that's it for our interview. So I, just to recap, we have demonstrated our motivation. We have did a, uh, we have done a brief uh, literature review, and we have uh, posed our research questions, and uh, and I gave a really uh, thorough method overview. So um, yeah, so I'm open to any questions you may have. Yeah, cool. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thoughts from the room? I, I have a bunch of comments in the um, Zoom chat. Feel free to take a look at those and incorporate them in the final mm -hmm. report. Thank you. Okay, then we move on to our next speaker. Uh, just at a high level, everything seems fine here. It's sort of a, a study design feels appropriate and so on. So I, I'm not worried about anything in particular. I just have some suggestions for uh, further improvement, but uh, it looks good otherwise. Thank you. So can I go next? Can I see it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, so this is the study I have been doing outside of this course uh, also. So this is titled like I'm trying to understand the collaboration challenges in building production machine learning system. So let me start with what I mean by machine learning systems. So uh, you might all know this already. So, but let me, if I give, I need to give an example, I can give an example of Google Photos where you have many software engineering features. You can share pictures, you can have your memories, sync your photos, but it also has some machine learning components within. For example, uh, it clusters your pictures based on the objects uh, that it gets. So I have uh, given one example of uh, my search in my Google Photos app. Uh, so if I search with sunset uh, in there, I'll get all the pictures that I have captured on sunset. So this is uh, one machine learning uh, component that is within one software application. So this is what I call uh, the machine learning uh, projects in this uh, uh, context. So now what do I mean by collaboration? I have been asked about this a lot of times. So let me clarify this a bit. So um, in this kind of projects, uh, there is like multiple stake Holders. There are many stakeholders who uh, there are data scientists who work on the models. There are software engineers who work on the um, graphing those models and giving some other software features as well. And as uh, it, the machine learning projects are dependent on different domains, for example, it can be used for clinical research, for final cell domains. So we need some domain uh, domain specialists as well. And uh, there is a need of operators here, as we need to come. 
constantly update the models, retrain those uh, to make it better uh, throughout the time. So there's also business teams and managers. So there's a lot of stakeholders who work together to uh, build one single uh, machine learning project. So um, what are the forms of collaboration we are interested in uh, are that how these people decompose those applications and uh, finally uh, compose everything again and come out with one single software. So how these people divide their tasks, negotiate on the negotiation happens on their responsibilities and how they uh, make contract with clients and they deliver things accordingly. So um, there's like different forms of collaboration and we're interested in all of those. Like it can be in physical and online platforms. It can be in formal meetings with clients and teams or maybe within the team there can be informal talks. Uh, they, they can have some formal agreements uh, or maybe just verbal agreement without any documentation and anything. So it can happen across different teams. Uh, it can also happen within the team. So we're uh, uh, fo focusing on all these kind of collaborations, but not any specific tools or techniques of collaboration, just broadly how people uh, divide their works together and how people finally compose these uh, final systems. So the question comes that why should we study this or what is the motivation behind this? Um, so there's a lot of articles nowadays that talks about that a large number of machine and applications, this 87% of uh, this project doesn't even go to production. And with all the problems I mentioned, there's also one problem they often mention is the lack of collaboration there, as data scientists tend to work alone. And when this kind of project needs to go on production, they need to collaborate with a lot of people. And there's a lot of inconsistencies uh, among those. And also it is often mentioned that even if one machine learning so, uh, model is working uh, very good, like it is giving good access it doesn't mean it can be accepted by the clients in a good way. So there can be other factors like response time, which needs to be uh, encountered by the business team that cannot uh, be maintained by the data scientists uh, alone. So which is why I have uh, seen a lot of articles and blogs that have been talking about how machine learning projects are different and how people face problems to collaborate with different stakeholders there, like the software developers, the operators and everyone. So um, one hypothesis that we have got from here is um, the machine learning projects are certainly different from the traditional software engineering project, but uh, we don't really know how and why and anything on that. But we understand that this is putting some additional challenges in collaboration. So if we look into the literature, so uh, there's not many papers that talks about the collaboration or anything, but there's certain papers that talks about that we shouldn't really uh, think the machine learning model from only the model perspective. So we need to think about the system perspective and how poor engineering choices can be bad for this kind of software as well. And there's also uh, studies, uh, there's different interview studies, surveys, and stack overflow studies, which talks about machine learning problems in general. Uh, it talks about how different processes uh, can be problematic, how deployment becomes a problem later on, but it really doesn't focus on the collaboration aspect much. Yes, there have been mentions about the organizational cultural problems and some lack of collaboration problems, but this, this is not a focus. And uh, in one particular study, I found that there is, was uh, a study for collaboration, but it wasn't really focusing on the challenges. Uh, so it was focusing mostly on in which uh, workflow steps the collaborations happen and what are the tools and practices around those. And it was a quantitative study, so we could only get the numbers, but we didn't understand uh, in these workflows why uh, these challenges may occur or we don't have any in-depth understanding of these things. So this is why the gap that we have found is that we, we really don't know why this collaboration is being challenging and how these challenges are coming up, who are the ones facing those and so on. So um, the hook is that if we could understand these collaboration challenges and if we could provide a clear guidance about effective collaboration mechanisms, then all the stakeholders involved in this kind of systems can be benefited. So uh, for the study design, uh, we could understand uh, initially that there is limited literature and we don't have one upfront theory here. So we need to come up with the theory development uh, with our methodology. So that is why I applied a uh, grounded theory here and to be specific, the Straussian grounded theory. And I started off with uh, some initial literature coding while I tried to understand the domain a bit. And uh, then I could come up with a code book and some uh, open end research questions. I'll go uh, into that, uh, all the uh, parts separately. So let me show a brief here first. 
so uh, then i if uh, then when i understood that what are the questions that i'd have to ask then i went for the same structure interviews there and uh, uh, later on i also uh, tried to incorporate the literature analysis so now all this process uh, these are actually going on in parallel there nothing is separate here so uh, as uh, in garden we need to do that we need to immediately and continuously do the data analysis so i'm doing that the like constant comparison is happening in all the processes and uh, like it can be a never ending literature survey or never ending interest, but we are trying to look for some theoretical saturation where we find uh, that no other no more things are mentioned about the collaboration challenges so, um, so when we started, we had some initial literature, uh, initial research question, but this was very broad and vague. Like we just want, only wanted to, uh, we have questions about what are the challenges, what are the stakeholders, and so on. So, with those uh, vague ideas in mind, I started off with this initial literature uh, coding. So, I went for open coding first. So uh, when I was uh, marking the papers with different colors, like for the stakeholders, yellow, for the uh, best practices, green, and for the challenges, uh, red. So I was also taking some notes and on what collaboration challenges they are mentioning about, what are the points that uh, they're having problems with, and so on. So later on, I could connect all those uh, uh, cores and come out with some Excel coding. Uh, and then uh, it was like a 250 um, uh, road uh, Excel sheet here with a lot of course and stuff. So uh, I have a research group with four people there. Then we again sat together and looked through all the course here and came up with a code book uh, where we I have right now uh, eight uh, broad level uh, course there with a bit hierarchy. And I have described uh, what I'm finding through all those codes. So I have put in the link. I'm not going into details here. Uh, so uh, afterwards, uh, then af I could drill down with the research questions and identify the dimensions that uh, are with uh, associated with collaboration. So then I started looking for uh, like what are the stakeholders and how they divide their works together, what are the forms of collaboration, what are the points they collaborate on, and what are the artifacts exchange and so on. And um, so later on, I could go to the semi structure interviews. And uh, for it, at first, I defined the interview guideline here. Uh, it came uh, uh, from it. Uh, I followed the code book and tried to uh, came up with the questions that I, I'd like to uh, focus on the challenges from that specific course. So I'm also not going into details in, in these things. I'm just put, I have put uh, the link here. So uh, for participant selections later on, I went for theoretical sampling when I uh, talked to one person and one person and then uh, from the uh, talks and from the code and analyzing what I get there, I tried to reach out to the next person. And I, I know that which is the other person that I need to approach for this. So this is how it's going on. And we're also trying to um, have maximum variation sampling. For example, and I'm approaching different roles here as we're focusing on the collaboration part. Uh, so basically, I have talked to data scientists, software engineers, software managers, uh, the clients, domain experts, so all of those who are associated with these kind of roles. And I'm also focusing on different regions. So I have uh, till now, I've talked to people from USA, Germany, Brazil, Egypt, Bangladesh, um, and so on. So I'm also trying to uh, cover different company setups. Like there is like big tech companies that have different uh, team topologies, and there's some uh, small startups. There's a medium company, so I'm trying to cover those up as well. But uh, we, while selecting the participants, we are really uh, focusing on the production level project because uh, that's how. Uh, the deployment and other collaboration parts can be seen there. Uh, so we are not focusing on any research or R&D processes there that can that might have very different collaboration issues. So for recruitment, uh, I have ap applied snowballing, snowballing here. So uh, like when I talk to one data scientist from one group, I take the contacts of the associate, the software engineer there or the domain expert there, and I approach those people as well. So this is how I'm uh, recruiting the people, and I've also uh, attended email workshops. I have talked to your communities, um, like maybe uh, knocking people on Slack channels and LinkedIn, uh, and also in my country, I'm talking to the tech leaders here to understand which are the companies that works on email and so on. So I have uh, talked to 38 people so far, and this is still ongoing and we're finding saturation yet. Um, so um, uh, after getting the interviews, uh, I uh, transcribe those and do the Excel coding and memoing as I have the code book right now. I uh, comment on what which code it, it is associated with and uh, make some summaries on what it really means. 
and um, then I uh, put it into my Excel and I compare all the text I'm getting now. So uh, what we have found out that um, this um, textual representation is not very well for the collaboration understanding. So we came out with one creative strategy of analyzing that with, with visual codes. So whenever I talk to one um, people or multiple people from one company setup, I try to draw the architecture of the team topology there. So uh, what are the other people they're talking with? How are they collaborating? Uh, with which aspects? Uh, so everything I try to put it in my drawing. And uh, then uh, when I find some challenges that they have mentioned about, so I try to put that challenge to the specific collaboration point where uh, they uh, found that. So for example, this is a picture of uh, one company uh, and uh, the code here associated is the data quality code. So I'm focusing on the data quality course here and uh, the challenge uh, is in some with the uh, interaction with some research team with the product team uh, where they have found problems of data quality. Uh, and found challenges on data quality collaboration. So this is how I have um, uh, like uh, created drawings for all the course that I have got till now. Like there are hundreds of drawings and I'm comparing those constantly. And as a group, uh, uh, me and my research group is trying to uh, do, uh, use card sorting here and trying to find some themes uh, about how I can uh, like add multiple uh, collaboration problems into one theme. So this is how we're trying and we are also validating those things. And uh, in parallel, I'm also working on the literature analysis. So for this, uh, it's, uh, let me um, tell us that it's not feasible for systematic literature survey. So because the scope is very broad and there's like so many communities that I say, there's like medical science, uh, there's uh, financial people and everyone is trying to deploy some machine learning aspects and pro having problems with implications and there is no clear keywords there. So let me show some of the titles that I get. Like uh, the first one is from a clinical career application. The second one is from autonomous driving and third one is for some advertisements. So all these papers are so different in domain and so different coming from so different communities that I cannot find these papers with uh, some search uh, there. So that is why I have applied uh, one approach of snowballing and reverse snowballing, which is also known as forward and backward snowballing as well. So uh, with uh, snowballing, I'm trying to find uh, the, I have some base papers and from those I'm trying to have the other papers through their references. And from the references of those papers, the other papers. So that is how I'm uh, getting the more papers. And also, I'm doing reverse snowballing, which is very important in this field because, like, this is a new and fast moving field. And new papers are coming, which is citing the papers that I've got right now. So I, I have put some Google alerts for whenever new some new papers come on and some uh, they cite some of the papers that I have. So I try to look at that paper also and see if that is also relevant for my study. So this is uh, I, how I'm uh, gathering the papers and uh, doing the auxil coding and memoing for those parts as well. So um, uh, now uh, there's a part of theory development. So everything is going on parallel. So theory development is also going um, uh, together with that. So I can share some initial results that I have. Um, so uh, for example, I have uh, put uh, some things about the data quality code that I have got till now. So they, uh, did from data quality, I have found collaboration issues with the machine learning team with the data provider. If the data provider is not within the machine learning team or is an external team, there's dissatisfactions with quality and quantity of data. So these themes like uh, they have talked about problems over guidance of data need. They have lack of documentations, data, uh, data requirement documents as well. So they have also mentioned about problem of understanding the data that they're getting. And uh, one complaint comes uh, very frequently that they have lack of control over the training data. So this is what the collaboration issue is when the data provider is outside of the machine learning team. And then again, there's another uh, issue about on data quality aspect that when the collaboration is with the product end, if the product end and the machine learning are two different teams, it can be from client, it can be some other team with the product team. So uh, they have problems of managing feedback, telemetry and drift. So uh, we know that in machine learning, if like, uh, uh, the inference uh, data can be very different from the training data if this is, it is not continuously updated. So uh, here they find the problem of priority that uh, when they need to monitor the drift, maybe the other uh, end doesn't uh, really co cooperate much. And there's also problem of clients understanding that clients often don't understand then that uh, machine learning products need to be continuously updated uh, for uh, keeping the uh, 
uh, good uh, success rate and so on. So which is uh, so I have uh, shared two collaboration issues mentioned about data quality and I have like in, in eight to ten course I have like more uh, themes like this. So this is how I'm working and the whole summary is here. So please uh, give me your feedback so that I can improve the research project more. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot. Any thoughts from the room? This was, uh, I thought this was great. It was very detailed. Um, if anything was too detailed, uh, so in your case and everybody else's before you, you were all over time. I was uh, hoping for 15 minutes each. Uh, nobody was able to stick to that so far. Uh, I guess minus 100, everybody. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I thought everything made sense and, and looked good. The one thing that I think you could sharpen up a little bit is uh, so what's special here? Uh, the, you know, collaboration has been a universal problem in software engineering, and I'm sure every other field since forever. Um, I And you know, when you um, gave your hypothesis towards the beginning of your study, um, it didn't really motivate why or sort of what was specific about this type of collaboration between data scientists or machine learning people and, and software engineering people. Uh, so I think really that's what you should try to focus on a little bit more to, um, because you don't want to probably give the appearance that you're uh, just trying to solve collaboration uh, everywhere in, in software engineering. You want to say that there's some so specific unique characteristics of this type of collaboration that make it particularly interesting, particularly understudied and unknown, you know, something that's very unique to the domain and the um, type of collaboration. And so just focusing on, on those as opposed to other things that are just universal issues with collaboration. Yeah, that, that's mostly because you gave me the time bounding of 15 minutes. <laughs> I cut a lot of slides because I need to focus on the method of it. Or, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, for the final report then. Okay. <laughs> right, thanks. Who's next? I think that's me. Um, so I did this presentation for my other class this morning in 12 minutes and 10 seconds. Um, you get bonus points if you stick to that. <laughs> I'll do my timer. Uh, in fact, I think I'm gonna shorten the, in, in interest of time, I'm gonna shorten up the, the background a little bit for this. So. Um, Okay, so my project is on cyber deception. Uh, in the paper, I walk through an analytical argument about why using cyber deception for defense might not be worth it. All of the literature that I found simply assumes that deception for defense is a good thing uh, and then dives into whatever the special topic is. So we'll talk a little bit about related work and a benefit cost analysis example and then a plan for uh, more empirical analysis. So this is the definition I used of deception, providing false or misleading information. The point here is that a defender is uh, doing this intentionally using this deception technique. And cyber has a lot of options for that. Uh, a lot of historical uh, warfare writers, Sun Tzu, Carl von Clausewitz, all talk about counterattack and striking back as a critical piece of defensive strategy in particular. And I'll circle back around to that, so keep that in your head for a second. So my research questions have to do with whether cyber deception is beneficial, uh, more beneficial than, than other techniques, and whether that's consistent across different combinations of defenders and attackers. So a little bit of background. Uh, current state of uh, state of the art, I guess, assumes that cyber conflict is asymmetric, that defenders have a hard time because they have to keep their networks open, the networks are complex, technology changes, those sorts of things. Attackers only have to have find one path in, in order to succeed. Uh, it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. When defenders focus on their critical assets and specific threats that they think will happen, when they prioritize those things, they actually have an advantage over attackers in that. In terms of strategy recommendations, it's really hard to make blanket strategy recommendations simply because of the wide variety of defenders and attackers and contexts in this space. 
So uh, again, counterattack is really important when we're talking about deception for general uh, warfare battle strategy. In the case of cyber, counterattack is actually not possible for these reasons. Uh, first of all, there's an issue with attribution. If you don't know who attacked you, you can't counterattack them. Uh, it's illegal in some countries. It's illegal in the US, for example, to hack back in most circumstances. There's some ethical considerations there. Um, maybe you shouldn't hack back. There's an argument to be made. Uh, and then there's also an issue with delayed attack chains. If you want to use counterattack, particularly for deterrent strategy, you have to be able to counterattack immediately after the initial attack. And you also cannot do that with cyber. Uh, these are the reasons that US Cyber Command has uh, started its policy of what they call defending forward. It helps them with attribution and it gets them on other networks um, so that they can counterattack more quickly. Of course, most organizations are not US Cyber Command, so we have to think of other ways to deal with this. Um, so here are some alternative defensive strategies. Deterrence by denial has been the, the ongoing strategy for most defenders. So this is working on your preventative monitoring, uh, recovery types of strategies, focusing on that. There's risk base, which is what I mentioned earlier, it's focusing on those critical assets. And then there's zero trust, which is data centric and focusing on um, protecting uh, small pieces of data, files, user accounts, things like that, assuming that your network has already been compromised. So these are the current strategies that are available. As far as tools and techniques that are available for cyber deception, uh, we can categorize these into four different goal categories. There's detection, which is the most important piece of cyber deception. Um, if you're using deception tools, they have a very low false positive rate for detecting attackers, which is really handy when you're trying to figure out who's not supposed to be on your network. There's distraction, which is kind of delaying the attacker while the defender does something else. Disruption, with, which has to do with controlling where the attacker can go on the network while you watch them. And then deterrence, which is frustrating the attackers, making them give up. And this can be done across different locations on the network, the endpoints, the host systems, uh, anywhere on the network, infrastructure, data itself, or various applications and software that might be on the network. So here's a list of the kind of common tools that you'll see that might be categorized as cyber deception. Uh, of course, varying costs for all of those. Um, you'll notice here that some of these tools and techniques can be done at different points on the, on the network, different locations. Uh, and they also cover different goals. Some of them cover multiple goals. So a lot of the current literature assumes that we need to take a comprehensive deception in depth strategy, which means picking through this list, uh, facing you know, different locations, you wanna get coverage everywhere, you wanna cover all of your goals, these sorts of things. So the strategies for this tend to be very complex if you actually want them to work. Uh, and complexity is not something that most organizations enjoy dealing with or can deal with for that matter. So I did a pretty extensive literature review. There are a variety of methods in these. Uh, a number of them are analytical. So working through step-by-step -step arguments for uh, why, why um, some of these things should work in cyber conflict or cyber defense. There's a lot of human subjects in psychology research. Uh, there's also a lot of probabilistic modeling, game theory type stuff, uh, both qualitative and quantitative. Of course, the computer science ones tend to be more on the quantitative side. Uh, the human subjects, um, analytical military theory is more on the qualitative side. So I broke my literature review into four different categories, these human factors, behavioral science. This is uh, the idea of controlling the attacker's thought, attacker's thought process, um, how we frustrate them from those processes. Uh, cyber deception is very new as a strategy. So there are a number of fairly recent papers on how we use this as a strategy, uh, different ways of looking at taxonomy for the tools. There are a lot of game theory papers uh, the interesting thing about the game theory papers is that none of them have the same model. So they'll cover their Stackelberg models, their Bayesian models, their zero sum, non zero sum, multi round, single round. It's just, it's all over the map in terms of what you find <clears throat> in this space. All of the game theory papers also cover 
specific cyber deception tools. So they may focus on Internet of Things, for example, or something like that. They're not comprehensive. And then the tool evolution papers mainly cover adaptive deception, which is using intelligence in real time, collecting on the attacker, and then trying to work with that attacker in real time to prevent them. It's one of the newer strategies for deception. So I spent some time on benefit cost analysis, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it here, uh, but the, the point with the benefit cost analysis is that this is how the defender uh, looks at this problem, right? Uh, the, the defender is looking at what happens if I don't do anything? What happens if I use a deception technique? What happens if I instead use a defense technique in terms of, am I gonna detect the attacker? Am I gonna prevent the attacker? Uh, what are the probabilities that those things will happen? These are the trade-offs that the defenders are making in their minds. So, of course, with this type of analysis, you can put in whatever probabilities you want and calculate that out. So, um, as a quick example here to, get, to make this a little more concrete, if we're looking at defense techniques, multi-factor authentication would be a defensive technique. That's the duo thing that we use for our phones. And then a password honey tokens would be kind of an equivalent on the deception side. And if we just assume completely random probabilities for each of these pieces, we can walk through and find a net benefit. And based on these completely random assumptions that support my theory, um, we see that the multi-factor authentication, the defensive side wins. But the problem here is that we can't, uh, we don't actually know what these probabilities are. So again, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna focus on how we find those probabilities or how I'm proposing those, proposing to find those probabilities. Uh, three methods, so it's a mixed method study. I believe it's a concurrent triangulation study. Um, survey, simulation, and human subjects experiments. And again, the goals of these is to estimate those, <clears throat> those costs and benefits to the defender. So we have several metrics, cost, time spent maintaining, and attack success rate are particularly important. So this is my mixed methods proposal for lack of a better slide. Um, <clears throat> survey will be conducted first, because I just time-wise can't do all of them at once. Um, costs for that go into the simulation. The simulation and the experiments uh, sort of validate each other in terms of probabilities of attack successes. There will be some machine learning research eventually on the simulation itself because that's a game theory model that can uh, be optimized once I find the correct inputs for those. I do have some details about the survey. Uh, I was going to do a slide on this um, for Thursday, but since we switched, I don't have a slide on it. Um, but I do have some details about the population and stuff for that. Um, but I think I'll stop here and answer any questions that may come up or any um, suggestions would be helpful as well. Cool, thanks. Yep, excellent timing. From my side, the big thing is, and I attribute this solely to you doing this today and not on Thursday, um, is I, I feel like you focus too much on the first part and not enough on the second part, which is the um, main point of this class. So I think for the final report, maybe reversing those a little bit, kind of um, maybe a little bit less background and so on, um, and a little bit more on the mixed method design for validation would be good. Yeah, sure. I, I have more planned, but cut it kind of short. So, I, yeah. I understand. So just, this is just for the final report and uh, suggestion. Uh, I was a little curious for the survey, um, who, who you're going to be surveying, um, how you're going to recruit them, do you know what exactly you'll be um, asking them to discuss those sort of things? Yeah, so the survey uh, focuses heavily on costs that are uh, 
being incurred. So it's the, the target is businesses of at least 100 or more people that have their own internal security team. As far as whoever, who would be answering it, it's positions like uh, chief information security officers, uh, CIOs, security team leads, that kind of person. Um, I looked at target population size for in the US, there are 158,000 businesses that fit those parameters. Uh, so 95% confidence interval, 5% margin of error comes out to 384 organizations uh, as a target number for that. As far as recruiting, a uh, bunch of different ways, I think kind of similar to, I think it was Nadia who was talking about this, LinkedIn, uh, reaching out to business organizations, community organizations that work with these. Uh, it'll be a difficult recruitment process. I kind of doubt we'll hit that 384 number just because these are the types of people that are wary to begin with of requests like that. Got it. Uh, Thanks. Anything else? Then great, thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to your report. And we have one more, I think, Jayun. Yes. Is that you? Yes. Great. Um, I will work on the timing. <laughs> Okay, we'll just deduct a uh, hundred points from everyone else that was over time. Oh, sorry, yes. Can you see my screen? No? Not yet, no. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, so I'll try to, sorry. I'll try to skim through the first parts. So um, I don't know how many of you recall, but on my research uh, relates to the retail investors use of accounting information and in investment decision making evidence from Reddit. So I'm just curious how many of you actually make investment on stocks, but <laughs> and how many of you actually look into accounting information when before making investment decisions. But um, so I think the problem is that the biggest problem is that there is a huge surge in the number of retail investors in the recent years. I am sure that this number has increased hugely in 2021 as well due to the pandemic lockdown and due to the uh, Robin Hood's um, easier trading platform and free stock trading fees. I think this is a, I don't know why my mouse is not working. I think this is a huge issue because first they usually disregard accounting information um, as evidenced from many researches. So, um, retail investors often disregard value relevant accounting information, even when they're readily available to them, even if it's right in front of them. And um, they instead they chase after attention grabbing trends or respond to trailing stock returns. So this leads to, although, although a lot of um, regulators, they spend a lot of effort in helping and perfect, perfect, protecting investors to reduce their um, awareness and acquisition costs. This leads to questioning the efficacy of the regulations. And also another important is that they turn to peer, uh, peers for opinions. So while there's evidence that um, users of the online communities are also individual investors, they go to other peers when they are not better in a better position than th themselves. And also because they're gathering and processing um, of information of processing of professional resources are limited. So is it, is it okay for them to seek opinions from their peers? Do they deliver value relevant news? 
So there has been, so because of the two points mentioned, there is the examining retail investors' behavior online is important. And there has been some researches that um, look into these, so, such as uh, looking at Google patterns and Edgar downloads. So Edgar is basically where you can download all um, um, financial statements of companies. And there has been some um, research on stock tweets, Yahoo Finance message boards. There are rarely looking into the content of the information. And even if they do, they do not look at the Wall Street Bad subreddit, which has by far the most uh, number of users online. Um, so the theory is that, the re as mentioned before, retail investors disregard. They make unreasonable decisions on, uh, rather than looking at accounting information, they make investment decisions depending on the trending stocks that are most discussed or hot stocks that are um, discussed in um, communities. So my first research question is, to what extent do retail investors use accounting information when making decisions? And also, is there a difference between the behavior of investors who invest in or post about Robinhood 50 stocks? So Robinhood 50 stocks is basically the 50 stocks that were on put on restriction of the number of stocks that you can trade because of the volume of trading that happened in like towards the end of January. So people who invest in Robinhood 50 stocks, they tend to be um, riskier and they tend to look for public opinion versus actually looking on to um, accounting information or at least that's what I'm expecting. And the second research question is, um, are stock prices correlated to the sentiment of Wall Street Bad posts? So if they are not correlated, then it means that you cannot really seek opinion from other peers. So my research design is qu using quantitative analysis. So I gather data from January 28th, which is when the surge happened until April 1st. Um, and I gathered the stocks that are mentioned more than 50 times during this period. So you can see this is a little bit more than two months. So I gathered the stocks that were mentioned at least once per day. And the stock, I gathered the pri stock prices during the period and quarterly accounting information such as revenue, net income, cash, et cetera. And of those, Robinhood 50 stocks were 13 of them and the 44 of them were not Robinhood 50 stocks. And I also gathered the Robinhood, I mean, Wall Street Bets posts. Um, I used posts instead of comments because they carry more in-depth and well thought out information than comments. And also I wanted to control for the frequency of over-mentioned comments. So for example, if a post was like um, GameStop to the moon and then there's like a hundred comments on to the post that has you know, the same, basically the same information, I might be over capturing those um, higher frequency mentions in comments. So I wanted to control that. And um, I gathered the number of posts that mentioned those tickers. So if a post mentioned GameStop three times, I would count that as one. And if a uh, accounting term is mentioned more than twice, I captured as more than twice because I wanted to capture, um, I guess, how, how many times a post or a ticker mentions accounting term. For the sentiment analysis, I used the uh, Python's NLTK natural language toolkit packages, sentiment intensity analyzer, and the text to emotion package. Um, so for the actual design of these, um, these questions, the, I used the most commonly used 35 accounting terms used, on online, used in online financial communities. And I further investigated the difference between the Robin of 50 investors and non Robin of 50 investors. And the, for the second part, I used the mixed effects linear regression model um, of the price change, which is basically a log of the price, closed price minus the open price divided by the open price. So basically, this will be if your open price is $100 and your closing price is 110 this would be like 10% increase in the log of that. Um, and uh, another factor for Robinhood, 50 stocks. 
and I wanted to capture if there was a correlation of the total number of messages, as well as the share is outstanding, besides the sentiment, uh, share is outstanding to capture if there were higher volume or lower volume of shares outstanding, would that impact the um, change, change in price? And also I controlled for the dependency of date and ticker among these data. Um, so here's the result. For the first part, I think, so I'm not sure how meaningful this p-value is because the number of samples for all in the 50 stocks is so small. But anyway, the number of accounting messages mentioned out of total messages is much lower in Robin of 50 stocks. And also you can see from here that revenue, like all these accounting numbers are much better in non-Robin of 50 stocks versus uh, Robin of 50 stocks. So basically I can conclude that um, Robin of people who invest in Robin of 50 stocks, they invest less into looking into accounting information. And also for the first, second part, I saw meaningful statistically correlation of if, if a stock is a Robin 50 stocks versus not. And I saw that uh, statistically significant correlation of happiness and fear. <laughs> but um, I'll mention the later slide, but this is a mere correlation, not a causation analysis. So we cannot say that people became happy or became fearful because of the stock change or this led to the stock change. And I, I did another separate regression analysis on, so these are two, two different models. And I think it's interesting to see that these sentiments are only correlated for Robin of 50 stocks and not, there, there's no correlation in not Robin of 50 stocks. So the implication is that for those who invest or post about non Robin of stocks, use accounting information more and therefore invest more um, investment in companies that have better financial figures as well as higher returns. So I think I missed. So if you're a Robin 50 stock, your returns are, the same day return is likely to be less versus when it's not a Robin 50 stock. And uh, non Robin 50 stocks show that there is still no statistically significant correlation between stock price change and sentiment. And considering that Robin 50 stock event is a one-time event, it's a special event, it is harmful to assume that public opinion in online communities impart value relevant information about the stock price. Um, as I mentioned before that uh, the limitation of this study is that the model observes correlation, not causation, and it does not factor in the interaction or trading of activities between institutional investors and retail investors meaning that institu institutional investors, because they have so much money and resources, they're likely to have these um, sentiment analysis of you know, financial communities and may take an action beforehand. So there might be less of, a, less of an impact on the change in price, if that makes sense. Um, that's it for what I have. Any questions or comments? Cool, thanks a lot. The last one sounds like it'd be a good baseline to compare against if you could get data. Mm -hmm. The institutional investors, I don't know. I don't know if you can get data about that, but it's interesting. The, the one question from chat was, do you know what happens to things that don't have investment information, like these crypto coins? Oh, <laughs> I think that's gambling, but I, I personally invest in them. Well, I mean, there is no like nothing underlying to those stocks, so I think it's really, really hard to see the underlying, I guess, impact. We resume on Thursday with another round. This was great. I really enjoyed today. So thank you so much for all your presentations. <laughs>